Good morning again, everyone. Um, I usually do send out the message just by email to the church members. So if you are visiting this morning and would like to receive the lesson, just maybe nudge the person to your left or to your right, and they can just forward that on to you. So it wouldn't be too hard to follow along. As well as I always encourage this, go around, brother. Um, <laughs> uh, I always encourage this to go back and double check what I preach, see what the Bible has to say, build your own convictions. And yeah. Come on. Um, it's been quite funny, actually, you know, thinking about what has been talked about today already, already, and as well as thinking about even the song that we just sang, um, talking about perseverance, wait in the water, wait in the water, like that's not something that we really like to do, right? Today, we're going to be talking about that one word that we've been kind of hearing a little bit today already, is the word perseverance. Uh -oh. Perseverance is one of those words... That makes you think right away when you hear it, this is going to hurt. Yeah. Right? There's no way of getting around it. It's kind of like when a doctor tells you that you're going to about to feel some pressure. The, the doctor never says, hey, this is going to hurt. They don't, they don't use that word because they know that's a trigger word. They use the word, hey, you're about to feel some pressure. <laughs> and then the next moment you realize pressure really hurts. <laughs> you know, it's the same kind of thing when someone says, hey, I, I want to have a talk with you. You already start tensing up in your heart. Like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> right? Sorry. See, you don't persevere through things that brings you joy. It only happens when there's a fight on your hand. Yeah. That's the only time you persevere through it. You never hear somebody, well, I had to persevere through my favorite TV series. You know, I watched it all night. I just had to watch. Like, no, they, they, there was no fight in there. Perseverance only comes when there's a fight. Mm. Perseverance is also one of those words that make you think, it's going to take a while. Kind of like when someone says, hey, I'll be one minute. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> Yo, I've learned, actually, that science is wrong. That we are not all on the same time period. I thought that we used to be, but then I discovered something called African time. <laughs> <laughs> Where five minutes to me is not five minutes to an African person. They say, hey, I'll be there in five minutes. Twenty minutes later, they show up like, yeah, I told you five minutes. Look, even worse, have you ever heard of Islander time? That's, that's a whole other thing. They don't even tell you that they're going to be like 20 minutes, excuse me, 5 minutes when they're 20 minutes late. They tell you that they're there when they're still there. Come on, Timoteo. I know, Timoteo, before we were studying the Bible, he, I call him and I say, hey man, we're here, where are you? He's like, yeah, I'm there too. I'm with Chris. I look, I look at Chris and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you're, you're nowhere near here. It's like, th there's a whole other realm of Islander time. They think that they're actually there. You know? But have you ever done that stupid thing? I think we've all done it a little bit. Where someone says, hey, just give me five seconds. And you do that stupid thing. Whoa. Five, four, three, two, one. Right? We all do that. It's the same thing when we start sowing and God says, hey, you need to persevere. We start counting down. Five. Four, three, two. Well, I'm only willing to persevere for so long. Mm. Why? Because it's one of those words, again, that you can't really respond with, I already did that. Mm. You can never respond to perseverance that way, right? Yeah. It's kind of like someone saying, hey, we have to have a loving relationship. Oh, I already did that. I already loved you. I already had faith. I already believed. I, I don't believe anymore. It's, it's not one of those words. You have to continue to do it. But perseverance is, we don't really like it, and we reach our limits when it comes to perseverance. Some of us actually have telling signs when we reach our limits. I know, I have like three stages of telling signs. My first telling sign is I breathe like I'm in a, a, a weightlifting competition. I breathe, I breathe it out. Okay, let me just keep going. And then I get a little bit more primitive. After I reach that stage, I get into the second stage where I'm kind of going caveman. Tegan has heard me a couple of times where I just grunt. <laughs> you know, I get mad actually. I, you know, I run a little bit. And then the last stage I usually reach is I bite myself. <laughs> those, those are when you know that I've reached my limit. I, I actually have telling signs. And we all can have these things. But regardless of how we feel about this word, perseverance, we will all face that choice in our life. That choice of are we going to continue or are we going to choose to stop? Mm -hmm. And how we ultimately decide will ultimately resolve in defeat in our life or victory. 
So to persevere means to be consistent in effort, not just in victory. To keep facing whatever effort, or excuse me, trial that we are facing, and to keep on doing that all the way unto our desired destination. Mm -hmm. So my title of my lesson this morning is Victory Through Perseverance. Point number one is a man who knew, or excuse me, a man who would know the cost. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Exodus chapter 5, and we're going to be reading about the man Moses. Exodus chapter 5, and we're going to be starting in verse 1. The Bible goes Genesis, Exodus, just the second book of the Bible, uh, chapter 5. Now, before we actually get to the point where Moses is starting to approach Pharaoh, if you don't understand or if you don't know the story, um, the Israelites were hard down, pressed down in slavery in Egypt, and Moses was the man to kind of call them out of their slavery. Um, to, get o to go over to the Pharaoh and say, hey, God has called his people to be let free, to go to freedom, and you need to let his people go. But before we actually approach chapter 5, it's almost by enchantment that Moses materializes from Egypt's shimmering sands, and, and he's come out of nowhere to kind of save his people. And what's, what's really cool is that he goes before Israel... And he starts performing these signs, convincing the elders and the people that he's the one that's going to save them. There's eye-blinding light and ear-sharpening thunder that would have dazzled many of the slaves. You know, euphoria, when, when Moses started to come, was the resurrected dead dreams that have long been buried in sorrow and unanswered prayers. And, you know, he, Moses comes before the Israelites and they were like, wow, this is going to be the guy who's going to take us out of slavery. But I don't know if you might have felt this sometime in your life where, have you ever felt uneasy because things were going a little bit too good? Yeah. Like, this, yeah. this isn't going to go right. I know maybe for members that in, in the church where you share your faith with somebody, and, they, they, and you say, hey, would you like to come to Bible study? And they say yes. You're almost like, well, this is going too good. You almost respond like how they respond. I don't know if I'm comfortable giving you my number. You, know, you, you almost like reverse the roles on them. But I, I wonder if Moses was starting to feel this. Of like, wow, everything seems awesome with the Israelites. Now I'm going before Pharaoh. We're going to see how his interaction actually is. Exodus 5, verse 1 through 14. It says, afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Let my people go. So that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he will strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave his order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. This is why they are crying out to us, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they will keep working and paying no attention to their lives. So then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I will give you, excuse me, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you find it, but your work will not reduce at all. So the people chattered all over Egypt, to, uh, scattered all over Egypt to gather subtle to use straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as you had straw. And the slave drivers, the Pharaoh slave drivers, beat the Israelite overseers as they appointed, demanding, Why haven't you met the quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? So we see here that when Moses went up to Pharaoh, he didn't have the response that he wished he was going to have. How this actually ends is in 19 verse 21. It is not only as they're getting pressed down, but before when the Israelites were blessing Moses and saying, wow, this is awesome, now they're going to start to blame Moses. The Israelite overseers realized that they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. Then they left 
Pharaoh, they found Moses and, um, and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, May the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. We read all this and we say, well, that didn't go really as planned. You know, I think supercharged by success and convincing Israel, Moses and Aaron anticipated a quivering Pharaoh. Like, wow, God has said this? To readily comply when confronted with, let my people go. But not only unconvinced, but Pharaoh wasn't even impressed by their demand. Not only unaware of Israel's God, but unconcerned about his demands as well. Not only unfazed by Israel's plea, but hostile now to their request. And we read something like this, and we almost start to think to ourselves, well, this isn't right. Everything got worse for them. Though clearly Moses was in the right, and Pharaoh was clearly in the wrong, you know, what, what, what happened here? Far emancipating from emancipating the slaves and aiming to break free, almost Moses starts to institute a more devastating solitude or servitude and a ruthless effort in Moses. And, and, and actually, not only that, now Moses is starting to be seen as a false prophet in the eyes of Israel. At the beginning, he seemed all lion, but now he's proven to be all lamb before Pharaoh. And we read this and we're like, wait, wait, that isn't right. He obeyed. He did what he was called to do by God. And yet that still led to failure. Moses must have speculated darkly. Man, hey, I, I didn't even want to go at all. I told God that, that I, I couldn't do it. And he starts to be like, God, I, I warned him I couldn't do it. And now he's fulfilled his fear. Why, oh why, God, have you sent me to Israel? Just to be the imposter to Israel and a fool to Pharaoh. And these questions and these things on his heart, they're so real and relevant that we can almost put ourselves in his place as well. Why have it, when I've been called to heights that scare, distances that tire, that even when I walk the pass, path, I still fail? And this time can be even more specifically painful when you feel like you gave every drop of your heart and you felt like you still didn't do enough. Even more so when you felt like you did enough, but someone tells you you haven't. Mm. And, and we, we have this response of like, why was it Moses' obedience blessed rather than leading to failure? Leading even to more perseverance that he's going to have to have. And we take note of different occurrences when this happened in the Bible. We know that Peter obeyed Jesus when he told him to put his nets into deep water, only to catch a, a number of fish that threatened his boat in Luke 5, verse 6 through 7. And the uh, disciples obeying Jesus when they told to cross the sea of Capernaum, only to face a storm that threatened their lives. This puzzles us. We, we understand being corrected when wrong or disciplined for our sin. But should we suffer when God calls us to obedience and we comply? It confuses our idea of perseverance. Like Israel, we begin to maybe wonder, should obedience be this difficult? Like Moses, we might start to ask, God, is obedience worth the price? And we soon realize that the question of our obedience is not quickly answered. Just like proving your love in marriage, you'll be spending the rest of your life answering that question. See, in James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that God has promised, excuse me, the Lord has promised to those who love him. We start to feel that perseverance is not quickly answered. And some of us might even envy Pharaoh in the beginning. Man, the influence this man has as a statesman around the world, his building programs... The, uh, the, the pyramids, all these things that he has. His mastery over two million slaves. Man, this guy actually has a lot going for him. But envy him now because you will have no reason to envy him for long. Because who wants to be Pharaoh when God marched his devastating death throughout all of Egypt? When they kill the firstborn? 
Who wants to be Pharaoh then? Who wants to be Pharaoh the day after Exodus, when all of the slaves actually leave Egypt into the promised land? His personal reputation ruined and shattered. His nation stripped of gold by the slaves. Who wants to be Pharaoh after the Battle of the Red Sea? Army dead in a heap? And his property, his slaves now singing victory hymns on the other side. Not even Pharaoh wants to be Pharaoh during those times. See, what this just teaches us is that there's a biblical principle going on when it comes to perseverance. Is that obedient perseverance costs before it pays. That it was always cost before it actually pays out. Consider even Jesus' example when he tells his disciples in Luke 24, verse 26. He says, did not the Christ have to suffer those things and then enter his glory? And in Hebrews 12 too, Jesus, it talks about when he's facing the cross, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. We find it hard that goodness is not always quickly rewarded with richness. We think that stocks should always go up. That only sickness should go on the unbeliever. Or that flat, flat tires should only happen on those that are road hogs. But no, that, that's not how life up is. Most of us are deceived by the question, why do bad things happen to good people? When to be honest, the reality is actually the opposite. Bad things always happen to good people. Why? Because good people are willing to face the bad in order to get to the perfect. And that is what perseverance is talking about. See? That's the ongoing challenge for us, is that we need to look past the burdens of perseverance and to the benefits that they provide at the end. Mm -hmm. And you can only do this when you learn to love the cost as much as you love the purchase. Mm -hmm. You have to love the cost as much as you love the purchase. And people do this with other things in their life. It's like when you buy something valuable for low price, you know, you see that sister with the nice dress and everything, you kind of try to compliment the dress. They don't even start talking about the dress. They talk about the price. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's an amazing dress. Oh, it's only $10. But, but I like the red color, but it's $10. They don't even care about the dress anymore. They just care that it was an awesome price. Yep. Yeah. In the same way, that's what perseverance should be like. Mm -hmm. You're like, wow, your, your life looks like it's going to heaven. Heaven, that's awesome. Yeah, but it doesn't even cost that much. I just got to share my faith. I just got to get through the trials. Yeah. But heaven, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I love heaven. I know my heart needs to be focused on it. But it, it costs so little. Mm -hmm. I just got to accept God's grace. I got to change things in my heart that I know I should be changing anyways. Well, that, that costs so little for me. Wow. It costs so much for God. I know it did. Mm. But it costs so little for me. See, we have to learn how to love the cost as much as we love the price. See, righteousness eventually succeeds and evil eventually fails. But Christians sometimes do good and nothing and nothing but bad happens. So they might conclude, well, good doesn't pay. And the unsaved do wrong and nothing good happens. So they might conclude that evil doesn't cost. But untrue is on both accounts. Evil costs and righteousness pays. Though either, neither might be immediately evident. So you must persevere to victory. God calls us to a victorious life, not a pampered life. Wow. Victory, again, is not one of those things, I've done it for a while. I've done it for long enough. No, you have to fight all the way to the end. Yeah. And that's what Moses did. In the beginning, he had all the promises. And, and he faced hardship. He was a false prophet. Things got harder from there on out. But at the end, we start to see that he was willing to persevere all the way to the victory. My challenge for my first point here is, knowing that salvation is by grace, yes, but discipleship is by works. Mm -hmm. Perseverance is something that is active and that we must do. Let us refuse to weigh obedience against the cost of it. Or let the degree of pain suffered or the amount of gain received determine our involvement in perseverance. Too high. Or if the gain is worth it. Perseverance is one of those things that we do regardless of the result. And that is the way that we can have victory in our lives. See, perseverance isn't always forever, though. That is something that is encouraging. 
Moses didn't have to persevere through every, at one point in time, he did get the victory. And that's what we're looking for in our lives. But in order to go from the hardships, perseverance to victory, he had to have no compromise. And that's what leads to my point number two, is a man who knew no compromise. See, Moses could be gloried with all the credit, credit as you start to read as well that his brother Aaron was alongside him. Um, Pharaoh was given the chance to surrender to God's will peacefully, but his heart was hard to the request. And why shouldn't it have been? You know, what, what kind of slave gets to kind of make demands of a king? But there were, um, that's kind of like once his heart was hard, that's when the plagues of Egypt started to come into play. And in the beginning, Aaron was actually one that spoke to Pharaoh. He's the one that actually had the staff. He's the one that actually performed, or at least God worked through him to do all the plagues. Um, this kind of changed later on, though. He started to do, you know, change the staff to a snake, brought forth the first couple of plagues, the one that brought the, the, the blood to the river, the frogs, and gnats. But by the fourth plague, we start to see a decline in Aaron's name in the scriptures. As you kind of read throughout the chapters, 20 times his name comes up in verse chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Exodus, displaying him as the one that was majorly talking to Pharaoh, as well as performing these, these uh, plagues. But it decreases to about only 7 times by the end of the plagues in chapters 9, 10, and 11. You start to see Moses take the lead role in bringing forth the plagues, as well as speaking to Pharaoh. Something that he feared most in the beginning of this request from God. See, perseverance does not only mean to continue doing something. It also means to not lose speed. There is no such thing as half-hearted dreamers. You cannot dream in half measures. And what we start to see is that Aaron in the beginning, he was there, he was present, he was giving into it. But for some reason he started to take the, the back step. And we start to see later on that this isn't just an occurrence that, that in scriptures, maybe he's just, you know, uh, Moses just wants to take the leadership. We start to see that he actually has a character of, of compromising. Later on, he's the one when Moses is up there getting the Ten Commandments, what does he do? He compromises to the people, makes the golden calf and gives it to them, somebody thing to worship. That Aaron might have started to compromise in this deed that he's been called to do by God. See, we all wish, though, that, that it wasn't that way, that we can persevere half-heartedly. We wish that we could change the world in our pajamas. <laughs> we wish starting that new life-changing life can start after waking up at 9 a.m. Mm. We declare, we love, we wish we could declare our love to someone through a text. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what we want is, we want to persevere, but not that much. We want to be willing to give only as much as we have in our hearts. Mm. See, there's a saying that says, sometimes it's not enough to do your best. It's in, uh, sometimes it's only enough to do what is required. It's a big difference between doing your best and doing what is required. See, Moses starts taking the lead, and I believe it's for good reason. Pharaoh actually starts to budge a little bit and gives the Israelites some wiggle room to kind of leave, but Moses would not compromise unless he was getting a total victory. We read here in Exodus 10, verse 8 through 11. Then Moses and Aaron were brought to Pharaoh. Go worship the Lord your God, he said, Pharaoh speaking. But tell me who will be going. Moses answered, we will, go with your, uh, we will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, and with our flocks and the herds, because we are able, excuse me, we are to celebrate the festival to the Lord. Moses said, the Lord be with you. If I let you go along with your women and, and children, clearly you are bent on evil. No, have only the men go and worship the Lord, since that is what has been, uh, uh, that's what you have been asking for. Then Moses and Aaron were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. So we see here that Pharaoh was saying, okay, hey, you guys can go, but you can only go as a men. The uh, women and children must stay. But we start to see that Moses still does not compromise on total victory. Not only certain people, but everyone must go. Not one person was going to be left behind. Mm -hmm. So another plague comes. Exodus 10, another kind of Pharaoh quivering comes before them and a little bit trying to get them to compromise, 24 through 29. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go worship the Lord. Even your women and your children may go. 
only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, You must allow us to sacrifice and burn offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our, our livestock must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. They even care about the little sheep. We're not leaving one of those guys behind. We have to use some of them in worshiping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know, uh, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, Get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. You know, it says here that not only was Moses un, uh, not going to compromise with leaving people behind, he wouldn't even leave the animals behind. You would think other people were like, Moses, come on, we got this far. How many more plagues are we going to go through? Can we just go? We'll, we'll leave one sheep behind. Is that okay, Moses? It's not one hoof. Meaning if an arm got chopped off of a little lamb, oh. we're bringing the arm with He's not, not even one hoof we're going to leave behind. <laughs> See, it says here that, you know, kind of puts on our hearts that victory was going to come in full or nothing at all for Moses. There's nothing that taints a win more than a compromise. It is in the details that we compromise, though. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm not compromising. I still believe in God in my heart. I'm not compromising. I still read the Bible. I still do these things. But we start to compromise in little ways. And that's where Satan tries to get in there. You know, you would think even Pharaoh was trying to, can I get him just to leave one sheep? Can I get him to compromise a little bit? And that's what Satan tries to put on our heart. Do we have to come to every church meeting? Do we have to share with every single person? Must we get open with every sin in our lives? Can we get, hide a little bit to ourselves? And this is where we start to see that perseverance is not something that could be compromised. Our relationship with God is not something that we can compromise. That Moses, he had conviction. And a person with conviction is someone who, who knows what he believes. That where he's going and why. Conviction is not forced on an individual, but it's something that is accepted and has on their heart. You know? Victory goes to those that are willing to... Excuse me. Victory doesn't just go to those that are willing to... Uh, that always succeed, but those that are willing to fail till they get what is right. Perseverance is not a long race. It's a short race, one after another. Yeah. Looking at the end of this, is, is where are you guys compromising in your perseverance? I know it can be hard, that perseverance word. We don't like it. We want, we want just to make it a little bit easier. But Moses, he wasn't going to leave anybody behind. And when we start to face perseverance like that in our lives, we see that no one's going to be left behind. That when the Bible gives us that dream to save the lost, to go and seek and save the lost, and it says, hey, you and your hearers, will be saved if you continue to watch your life and your doctrine. If you don't compromise on those things, your hearers will be saved. Not one will be left behind. Mm -hmm. It takes some time, though. You start. We, we, we know we probably heard this story about 20 times with Jessica Salvador's mom getting, <laughs> getting saved. But, but why? Because it, it took years to persevere. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that the, that, that the game's over yet. Mm -hmm. There's still many, many more. In the same way, we have to view perseverance that way. We cannot compromise. Or else, what if our one compromise equals to one person in our life that's not going to be saved? Ooh. That there's an equal exchange. You're compromised for people's lives. Now we start to view compromise very different. That's how Moses felt it in this, right? Mm -hmm. So I can't compromise my women and the children. I can't compromise there. I can't compromise our sacrifices with the animals. In the same way, we have to look at perseverance this way. My last challenge is do not compromise in your path to victory. Have enough fight to not stop short of your aim. What are your goals that you started to set up for your guys' stuff? For your Bible talks? For, for the Christians that are in the church that I just recently we talked about? Hey, what goals and dreams do you have on your heart? Okay, it's been a little bit harder this first week, might, you might have felt. And you might be like, well, hey, can we lower the dream a little bit? You would think even Aaron might have started talking to Moses. Can we lower it a little bit? Mm. But now you can't compromise. Mm. Keep going after your dreams with all of your heart. Come on. You know, in conclusion, 
Perseverance, that still may be a word we don't really like. But it is a word only for the strong. Because the Bible talks about here in Romans 5, 3 through 5, that perseverance is going to create something in us. This is not only so, but we glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Guys, as, as much as we feel and don't like that word, I just want to encourage everyone that we have to make that decision to keep persevering all the way into victory without compromise. Thank you guys very much.